I would have preferred that we sold off the grains all the way into Tuesday. Then I think the funds would have had a clear path towards uh, selling the rumor and buying the fact. Uh, the fact that we rallied on Thursday and Friday and got a little uh, more neutral sentiment makes it a little tougher call. I think on the corn side, if you, if you have a, a, a corn stocks number under 11.1 billion, it'll probably be bullish. If it's 11.4, uh, 11.5, it'll probably be bearish. In between, it's, it's kind of a toss up. Weather moves the needle during the growing season. And right now, of course, that's the South American growing season for the most part. Uh, it, it's, it's affecting some other markets as well. South Africa is going to import corn rather than export. Zimbabwe, same thing. Uh, those are El Nino effects. India's wheat crop is down. Australia, we think, is down, although USDA hasn't lowered the numbers yet. So, yeah, weather makes a difference. The uh, U.S. spring and summer weather is just really difficult to call. Our, you know, our weather forecasters just aren't that good that far out. Uh, as I tried to point out in the presentation, you're probably sitting closer to the bottoms than the tops. Okay, we've we got fairly good support levels in that 330, 340 area for corn from a diff number of different methodologies. Uh, so if you're a cash only guy, you sit there and wait, I think. Uh, if you've got to move product, you, you shop basis. There are some excellent basis opportunities around there, particularly in the eastern Corn Belt, but uh, there are end users that need grain. So, uh, or your other alternative is you put it under loan. You only get less than two bucks a bushel for corn to put it under loan, but it does buy you time and gets you some cash flow. Uh, soybeans, you, you, you have a meter running, which is that South American production coming on, and, and there's been a few fields in Brazil harvested, but most of it won't hit until late February or March. Uh, but you know you've got an end date there. You, you want to move most of your production before they get into the world market in a big way. 2016, 17, I, I really don't like doing those forecasts this early, uh, but the, the key point is if we do in fact switch to a, a, even a neutral weather scenario, not even going to a full La Nina, just a, what we call the trail year of the El Nino, the odds are fairly decent for a drop in U.S. average yields. And I, I think that's very significant. Uh, the illustration I gave on, on screen was 162 bushel national average corn yield, which would be an average 4% a little over 4% drop from what we had last year's final. And that's, that's a typical drop in the second year of an El Nino pattern. So uh, that, would, that would get corn prices back to four bucks. So I think it's fairly significant. Uh, it doesn't take a whole lot of a, a full, uh, full bore drought to get us $4 corn. It just takes a little bit of a, a fairly typical glitch on a year after an El Nino. Yeah, it's, it basically ensures a certain level of, of consumption in the United States. Uh, I know there's moves afoot in Congress, and at least one presidential candidate wants to get rid of the RFS. But the, as I mentioned, I think we basically were operating under a free market environment for most of the past year anyway, because we didn't have the mandate levels. The market had to assume, uh, had to do business without knowing exactly how much they were going to be committed to. So. Uh, I, I don't see that as a major issue. It, it does guarantee us a, a, a base level of consumption. And of course, as I mentioned, the number is 500 million gallons bigger than it was in May when it was first proposed. That's 177 million bushels of corn or Milo or something uh, more than we thought we would use otherwise. So it's, it's, a, it's a, definitely it was a positive versus what they'd given us in May. Yeah, I, I think the, the E10 requirements uh, in China will ensure that they're going to take some ethanol for a, for a while until they get some more ethanol plants built. Uh, the question is, you know, they've got a huge number of cities of over a million population over there, and only nine of them are currently under these E10 requirements, or nine provincial areas, in some cases it would be multiple cities. So if they uh, start to expand that, maybe because of the Paris Accords, uh, that, that uh, need for ethanol could go up rather than be static.